All right, so this demonstration, I'm doing something that I did last year, and it's called the iodine clock reaction. Okay, and it's that reaction where I mixed two chemicals or two clear solutions apparently, and after some time period, you saw that black, dark star, um, uh, starch iodine complex, that blue black uh, kind of all of a sudden appear. And it's a clock reaction, and here's the overall reaction, and here's the rate law. Okay, what we're going to do is test to see if it's first order with respect to the iodate ion or the metabisulfite ion, sometimes called the hydrogen sulfide ion. Now, what is this all about? Well, um, the starch iodine complex is a test for um, essentially starch. You, you, you see this all the time. You may see uh, someone take a uh, $20 bill at a, um, at a store or some kind of consumer place and, and, and take your money, 50 or 100, and swipe it with a yellow marker. And that yellow marker actually has iodine ions, or iod I should say iodine on it. And if it makes, I should say iodine ions, I should say, if it makes a dark blue appear and they put the iodine ions on it, they know they're dealing with uh, starch. And of course, uh, starch or cellulose are, are, are something that is in counterfeit money because the money that we actually make is actually in, um, it's actually not made of, uh, of starch or cellulose, it's actually made of a, uh, a polymer, okay, like uh, a cotton. If you think about paper, you feel about the, pa the um, um, ever feel what money feels like, it's not regular paper. It's actually more of a cotton-based fiber than it is a regular paper that's made of these things. So in uh, any case, you've seen these tests, but this is a very famous clock reaction. Now why? Because what we're having here is the iodine, when it builds up, will cause the uh, long chain polymer, the starch, to act like a ligand. In fact, it's the I3, I2 with I3 causes, when that builds up with enough iodine and I negatives around, you'll make that I3 complex that we studied. That I3 complex actually has three lone pairs of electrons in its trigonal bipyramidal family for electron domain geometry, it's linear. Okay, so it has sp3 dehybridization if you want to go that far with the hybridization. So this complex, we've dealt with this ion. So when you build up enough iodine with the I negatives, you'll create this complex. And it was a test you had in biology for starch. You had starch and you added the iodine and you got that uh, dark blue color, you had, you had these starches. Now, for us, we're using it as a clock reaction. Now what makes it a clock reaction? Here's the mechanism. Here are the three basic steps. Here's the iodine ions that I already have in my beakers here and the hydrogen sulfite or the metabisulfate ion is going to be in my starch solution. So I'm going to pour them together. But before I get started, let's talk about this. So the iodate ion and the uh, metabisulfate ion make iodine ions and sulfate and, pr and protons. But you can see that this is my what? Catalyst or intermediate that links one step to the other. I'm producing the I negative one and the I negative one starts the second. It's an intermediate, right. So this intermediate I negative hooks up with the protons, well at least the protons catalyze it I guess, um, and with the iodate ions, some more of them, you produce I2. Now this I2 in high enough quantities with the I negative one would be enough to create the starch iodine complex. What clocks the reaction is the third step in the mechanism, whereas the I2 that we have in solution, that's your intermediate, reacts further with uh, a metabisulfate ion to make more free ions. These free ions react with the iodide ion and it continues. It goes from second to third, second to third. Again, right, the iodide ions produced by this reaction react with the iodide to produce the I2. The I2, okay, in this case becomes negative or uh, gains electrons from this redox reaction with the hydrogen sulfate. Um, or metabisulfate ion and produces the I negative again. So this clocked itself and it keeps going until essentially um, I'm going to either run out of the iodate ions or the metabisulfate, okay, until eventually some, one of these runs out and essentially I'm left with the iodine building up with the I negative and creating that blue block, uh, blue black complex that we talked about. So it's a nice pretty clock reaction. We played with it last year for the most part. And it's a nice, easy one to make. But we're going to test for um, whether or not this is a first order reaction. Now, a couple of ways I can do that. I could take a concentration of potassium iodate and I could uh, see how fast um, that reaction goes. Or 
I can, and I can, how fast it goes depends upon how much time it takes for it to go blue-black. Okay, and I can measure that time period. But think with me for a second. If I do it this way, if I double the concentration of iodate, iodate ion, and it was first order, what would I expect the rate to do? If I double the con initial concentration of the iodide ion, what would I expect the rate to do? To double. Now, doubling the rate in this type of experiment would mean that the time would double or the time would half. Time would half, right. It would be half as fast because, remember, it's speed. Molarity per second is how fast you would get it. So, so if it took 20 seconds for it to go blue-black and I doubled the concentration and now it went 10 seconds, that told me that you double the concentrations, you double the rate because you had the time it took. That would be first order. Just be aware of that process. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it a different way. Um, but we can still work that math out. I'm going to plot a graph of the lin of the A over time. Before I do that, we were talking yesterday about something called the Arrhenius equation. And we were talking about the effects of the Arrhenius equations and what it builds. The Arrhenius equation essentially looks at one factor, and here it is. If you look at activation energy, e to the negative ea over rt, you, this is the gas flow constant times temperature kelvin, a, and this is k. This e should be on the same page here, but this is an exponent. Now, what does this tell us, the Arrhenius equation? The Arrhenius equation tells me that the k, which is the rate law constant, right, right here, is dependent on a couple of factors. Number one, it's dependent upon temperature and the E of A. What was the E of A yesterday? Activation energy. It's the energy needed to get past that transition state in our potential energy diagrams. And then we have temperature. So there are two factors here that affect K. The rate law constant that we have here that you guys have been solving for is affected by change in temperature. Now, what are these factors? Well, first of all, what is A? Okay, this is the Arrhenius equation that links the rate law constant of reactions to their factors. A represents all of the molecules that you have if they all had enough activation energy to start. So that represents all the molecules they had. This is going to represent some, uh, when you do the math, it's going to represent some kind of um, decimal that you multiply by it. Now that decimal represents finding what? A percent of how many total A's or molecules you have that have enough energy to overcome that activated complex. Don't forget that activated complex is at high energy, okay? Highest energy potential we have in a reaction coordinate. A reaction coordinate, guys, is essentially our what? Potential energy curve. You start what? Low, and we go high if it's endothermic, this represents the pathway. Remember, it's a path function. This point right here represents our transition state or our energy barrier. What is that barrier? If it's two atoms colliding, it could be the outermost electrons trying to do what? Overcome themselves. In order for a reaction to occur, there has to be an effective collision. That effective collision means you have enough kinetic energy to get past the transition state, which could be just the outside of the electrons of very small atoms, because there's going to be repulsion. And the second thing, you have to have proper orientation. Especially in big molecules, there's only places where bonds can occur. Think about pi bonding. A lot of reactions occur at the double and triple bond because those pi bonds are exposed away from the nucleus a little bit, as opposed to a what? A, um, a sigma bond. So where the pi bond is, is where the bond can occur. So collisions have to be at a certain spot and have to have enough kinetic energy. Those are the two conditions for a reaction to occur. But you still, all reactions have to overcome this hump here, this highest energy area called a transition state. Sometimes it's an intermediate that locks, okay, just before. We can't really measure what that substance is, but it's a barrier. And it could be the outermost electrons. It could be a point where the two atoms are, are, are basically represent an intermediate of the final outcome. Bottom line is, all reactions have this to overcome. So this amount of energy to get past this is E of A. Now, we have to think about E of A a couple different ways. E of A is the activation energy. How is it linked with temperature? Okay, well, it's linked with temperature because, well, if you look at the distribution 
of how molecules are heated. Let's watch this. We've done this already. The Boltzmann distribution. So watch this. This represents a distribution of molecular motion at a certain temperature. We know that at a certain temperature, molecules have a whole range of speeds, and we actually calculate the most probable speed as the root mean square speed way back when. Now, this represents our E of A right here. This represents the threshold where the molecules could have what? Could have enough activation energy to overcome that transition state, right? Now, if I increase the temperature, right, what happens to this curve? It dips down, doesn't it? When it dips down, now you can see, assuming that I drew this correctly and the area is the same because this height is the number of molecules, now you can see that there is a larger what? Fraction of molecules who now have met the energy requirement and the reaction can go forward. So increasing the temperature always increases the rate of reaction because now you have a larger fraction. So we go back to the Arrhenius equation, which has that A, time, which is all the molecules, times this fraction, which is E to the negative EA over RT, Increasing the temperature, okay, makes the graph go forward. And if you increase the bottom number, this makes it a smaller negative exponent. So your K gets bigger. This whole thing equals K. Which makes sense. Increasing the temperature, your K value goes up. You need to know that. It's temperature sensitive. All right? Why? And this is what they could ask. The reason is more molecules now have met their energy requirement, have passed the threshold or the activation energy. There's one more thing I can do though, okay, which I will not do in this demonstration, but one thing I can do is I can actually change the activation energy. What if I pull the activation energy forward, like in an inhibitor? If I make that bigger, what do you think the value of the K, the rate constant, is going to do? It's going to go down. If I make this bigger, E of A becomes a larger negative value. And therefore, K is going to decrease. But what if I could make the E of A, the activation energy, go this way? What would happen to my K? If I made the activation energy threshold to drop, what would happen to my K? Yeah. Make an E of A get smaller, you get a smaller negative, and your K goes up. It's all about the fraction. That's what this is, the fraction of molecules that have, have surpassed that threshold. That's the Arrhenius equation. Now, you're not responsible for calculating with it, but you are responsible for understanding how K changed with temperature and activation energy. Now, what does a catalyst do? Well, a catalyst does two things. I've been telling you all the whole time. It makes a mechanism occur that does what? Lowers the overall activation energy. So if you think with me for a second, look at our potential energy curve again. Right here. Here's two things a catalyst can do, and you're responsible for knowing this. A catalyst can create a whole series of mechanisms, instead of a one-step process, could have a, a two-step process. And if you measure the activation energies, of each of these, and you add them together, they'll be lower than without those two steps. And you would say that we have lowered the cost to start the reaction. You've lowered E of A, which means you've made that a less smaller number, and K goes up. So you can start a reaction mechanism like this by adding a catalyst, although this doesn't have a catalyst. And the series of steps, if you add up all the individual activation energies, if they're lower than they're without these steps, you have, you have increased the rate of reaction by changing the pathway. These are pathways, the mechanism. Another way, and this is another way you understand this, is by not changing, let's say, the pathway or the mechanism by stabilizing the transition state. Think with me for a second. What do enzymes do in a biological process? Enzymes hold on to a substrate. By holding on to a substrate, they expose the part of the substrate that we want to collide with. 
So they help with the orientation. Sometimes the enzymes will change the three-dimensional structure of the reactant in a way that exposes more binding sites for the collisions. So enzymes, especially in biological process, lower the activation by what? Stabilizing, lowering this transition state, making it more stable, therefore lowering the cost necessary. Think about a catalytic converter in your cars. Inside your cars, you have oxygen and you have nitrogen. With high heat, you're producing, besides the combustion of the, of the gasoline, you're produce, producing NOxs, which are very dangerous, NO2s, N2O5s, a whole bunch of nasty compounds that we do not want in the environment. These NOxs hit a basically metal surface. That metal surface attaches the gases, and what it does is it exposes and basically helps stabilize the transition state, making it easier for the other molecules to collide and react with. So two ways that we lower the activation energy and increase in K. Create a new pathway, which is a whole new series of steps where the activation energy is collectively the three steps is lower than the single step, or we use enzymes or catalysts that what stabilize and make the a transition state less energetic by lowering the activation energy. Okay? Important that you do that, understand that. All right? Now, of course, we have uh, different types of catalysts that can be in different phases, but that's about it for what you have to know for this rate law. Now, let's go back to the test. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to take some baseline measurements. We're, we're going to test temperature right now. So we're going to do this reaction, and we're going to take room temperature. Okay? What I have is an iodate ion concentration. And I'm going to drop some starch on it that has this on it. Now, we're going to go to a uh, site here that gives me a timer. So I want to kind of click out of this. And let's go to my timer. Someone's going to help me with this timer. Okay. Katie from Haiti? You're in charge. Okay, so Katie from Haiti, hit, let's just test this out. Katie from Haiti, hit start. Move your cursor over to the stat. Okay, you're going crazy now. All right, now we're going to move over to the start. Okay, now hold, hold on, hold on. Okay. Katie, don't drag you the You guys are like, hey. Let's turn it one way. I think you turn it like this, and then, 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 it, then it's everything oriented for you. And you want to use this side. Okay. Okay. No, you don't want to touch it. You're like dragging the mouse. Oh. Okay. Oh, hold on. <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> Apparently, I didn't make a wise choice. Katie and Haiti's killing us. Oh, yeah, go back. It's a hard to do to look. I'm doing it now. There's a lot of hovering. I can, I can All right, there we go. Online timer. I guess I'll go forward here. Sorry. Easy to use. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe let me do it. All right, let's do that one. Okay. Okay, hit start. See what happens. Okay, hit stop. Right on it. There's a big green button. Okay, now hit reset. Great. Now we're good. So here we go. So here's our potassium iodate solution, okay? And we're going to see how long it takes at room temperature, okay? So I have the potassium iodate, I have the metabisulfate, I have the starch. Ready, set, go. Remember, the reaction is a clock reaction. If I didn't have that clocking system set up, you would see it already. So we have to run out of something. and. Is it the iodate ion that it's based upon? Is it a metabisulfate ion? We're going to kind of test that. Okay, we're getting around where I think it should happen, around 30 seconds or so. All right, and there we go. Okay. We're slow on that, but that's okay. We're going to get better. It's like 31.5. All right, so about, about 30 seconds or so, plus or minus five. It looks like we're going to deal with, <laughs> with the Yesha factor. Okay, 
Now, <laughs> yeah, so that's room temperature, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the temperature. Again, E of the negative uh, Ea over Rt times our A is our K. So I'm going to increase the temperature. Increasing the temperature makes this a smaller negative exponent. So a smaller negative means K is going to get bigger. Okay, so I have it heating. So let's start this again and see if we can do this one more time. This is my um, um, start solution. I have the other one on the hot plate and it should be barn already. Okay, so this one is very warm. So if I increase the temperature, like equilibrium constants, rate law constants are temperature sensitive because of that. So here we go. We reset. Are we ready? Yes. Set, go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a good practice because the next thing we do is going to require more precision. All right, so here we go. We should, boom, stop. It, it, it would be helpful to keep it there. Okay, because then when you, when you like move all over with the cursor, you're not ready. Oh, <laughs> or use your hand. Okay. So 17, so clearly this, was, this reacted faster. Now intuitively, you know, by going faster, there's more collisions. By more collisions, there'll be more effective collisions, but I want you to think what happened. By increasing the temperature, our distribution of speeds got smaller and we moved what? We moved beyond E of A. So we were here, E of A was here. By moving this forward, we now had more molecules beyond this threshold, and now the reaction went faster, okay? That's how you have to understand that. Okay, now, let's go test to see if, in fact, this is a first order. I want to know if this reaction is based on what I do with potassium iodate. If I want to do um, reactions, okay, and I want to control and understand the mechanism, I want to see what order this is. So, what I'm going to do is I have some... Uh, decreasing concentrations here of potassium iodide in the beakers. So I have 0.02 to 0.017 to 0.013 to 0.01 to 0.007. And what I'm going to do, party people, is I'm going to do the same thing. Now we're only going to keep these at the same temperature. All right. And by keeping it at the same temperature, okay, I am going to test for differences in the initial concentration, which we normally do. All right, so let me just clean this up. And we're going to do this step by step. Yesha is all practice up. She got all the, um, the jitterbugs out of the way. Okay. We'll get, a back, we'll get a backup clock. No backup clock. She is going to be it. Okay. Pressure is on. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the time it takes to do these. Now, how am I going to test for first order just by looking at time. How can I plot this graph? If it's for first order, what should the graph look like and what are my parameters based on the integrated rate equations? Linear. It's going to be linear, slope's positive, negative, negative, and what's my y-axis going to have? Uh, lin. The lin of the concentration. So if you notice, we're going to take these natural logs of these concentrations in a second, but I have to get these times. All right, so let's do this. All right. Um, Make sure I can see it. And there we go. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, but good enough. So what I have here is different concentrations. Now, if you watch me do this, I added 60 milliliters, 50, 40, 30, 20, then I diluted it, and using MV equals MV, I figured out at the new 60 milliliter uh, solutions when I diluted with water what the new concentration would be. So that's how I did it. I added 60 milliliters, which I didn't touch, which is 0.02. Then I added 50 milliliters of the KiO3 solution, which is 0.02, and um, 40, 30, 20. And then I diluted back up to 60, and using MV, I got the new equations. Okay, so now I'm going to add equal amounts of my uh, equal amounts of my start solution, which is not in the rate law, so it doesn't really matter. But in any case. It does have the metabisulfite ion in it, which we're keeping constant. So, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do the first test and see how long it takes. It should be around 30 seconds because I have the same concentration in the first beaker. I'm going to say ready, set, and you can go, all right? Okay. 
Sometimes I'll forget, so you gotta watch me. Ready, set, go. Yeah, we got it going. I saw that. Yeah, skills are there. Skills are there. Okay, so we're clocking the reaction. The iodite ion is definitely uh, reacting with the metabisulfate producing. Okay, I negative, I negative is reacting again with the metabisulfate to make I2. Now that I2 wants to find the I negative to make that I3, that linear molecule, with the starch. But the third step is consuming the I2 back into ions. And what do we have? 29. Stop. So what do you got for time? I messed up. Yeah, I'll say with 29. <laughs> okay. I'm feeling 29.4. Well, since we're guessing, I don't think we can be confident of the point four, right? 29. Our guess is the nine, isn't it? Are we guessing the full second so we can't write down? Just think about sig fix. So what's with 29 seconds? Okay. Now, we're going to do the next one. Clear it? Okay, you guys, all the backup people too? All right, here we go. So now I'm going to do one that is less concentrated so the time will be longer. Right. Ready, set, go. Any um, any takers for a time? 31, 32, 34. 34. Points. This guy feels confident. I think it's gonna be 34 points. Uh, What did you say? 34. Yeah. 33.9. Oh, you have point nine. I think it'd be less than a minute. Hedging all bets. Here we go. Here we go. Make a liar out of me. Now! 36.513. Oh, I get 5.3. So it's 36. Do 36, yeah. Okay, next one. Clear it? I'm doing it as soon as the first drop test. That's when I started. Yeah. Ready, set, go! 36. Anyone pick 36? Now we're at point one three. Any any takers? I'm gonna say forty on the top. I'm gonna say forty one. Oh, oh, forty two. Forty one. Forty one. Forty one. That was plus seven. Yeah, I'm feeling forty two. All right, we're taking bets in chemistry. I'm gonna say. Let's go Clearly, concentration is lowered. Okay, that means there's less molecules to collide with. The reaction rate drops. Okay, so here we're getting close. I, I, what did I say? Forty. I said, I said whatever it comes up. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, 40. 41. Oh, 42. No. 43, yeah, Matt. Yes, go. 44, 44 maybe. 44.5. Same 44, 45. You're pretty good, though. 44.58. So we'll say 45. Good job. I got 5. I got 5. I know I'm paying 45. I got 5. All right, here we go. <laughs> Next one. What's our numbers? I'm gonna go 50. 50. All right. 52. Actually, 53. 49. I'm going with 62. Oh, ready, set, go. I'm not very good at this. I know my story. Because I'm talking while I'm doing it. What have I done? What was my number? 62. I think I might have made it 62. <laughs> Who says I was, I'm scientific? I teach science. But, uh, 49. There's too much going on, so I'm talking and I'm like, I didn't tell you guys. I'm 51. Good thing Margaret I had in the first, because she's like, I, I for the six of these or five of these, I did like one and told her, but she was watching me every time, because I was just talking. All right, so. Here we go. I'm thinking 61, right? Oh, I did this to class before, so I'm kind of... Cheater. Yeah, I definitely am a cheater. I'm a tall cheater. Oh, now! That was a pretty good stop. Now, what do we think it was? 58, 59? 59.08. 59. 
Okay, last one, because I am recording. I'll give you the break after the demo. Okay, ready, set. You gotta watch me, because I'm sneaky. <laughs> oh, numbers? I'm saying 92 seconds. Okay. I'm saying 90. <laughs> <laughs> ready, set, go. Yeah, All right, let's see. That's such a big leap. 92. Well, is it an exponential? I can't look at both of them at the same time. Think, of, think about this, guys. If it is first order, didn't we talk about half-life graphs yesterday? So if it is first order, this is the concentration of A. Don't you expect that? That's why we're getting an exponential difference. Here we go. Oh, no. You're about 60 like seconds off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got some time. So in this this demonstration, I'm I'm I'm, I'm dealing with K changing, right? I'm changing the concentration. K is constant. Temperature is constant, and I'm not adding a catalyst. Okay, we're at 60. Because it's look at this. If it if it's first order, that's the that's the curve. It's not a linear. So the minute and 31 seconds is when the around when it should change. Here we get. I'm saying at 90 seconds. <sighs> Go! You said 92. Oh, 121. Oh, 121. Oh, 21. Yeah. 121. Yeah. So it's at 81. 81 seconds. 81 seconds. Everyone agree? Yeah. Okay. So if notice, this was increasingly what? The, the, the concentration and time changes were doing what? It was not linear. So if you think about it, this is a this looks like this could happen for first order, but we don't know until we do the lint. So let's test it and let's do the someone give me um, the natural logs of these. I think I'll do it for you since I've messed this up. So the natural logs, get this out of the way. Now it's the natural log of the time or is the natural log of the concentration? The integration. The integrated formula. So I'm going to do uh, natural log of the concentration, natural log of 0.02. That gives me negative 0.391. Okay. Uh, natural log of 0.017. That gives me negative 4.07. Then I get... Natural log of point zero. Please don't put anything I am supposed to. Oh, just the weather. The weather? Okay. <laughs> point oh. Delete all of those hundred tabs. And then last two. Natural log of point oh one. It's free fun. Negative 4.61, and last one, natural log, 0 0.007, and negative 4.96. Now, what the natural log will do to an exponential is flatten it out. So we, we saw that clearly the time was definitely changing exponentially, wasn't it? What the natural log will do is take that change exponentially and flatten it out. We do that a lot of times. So we're gonna make we're gonna see if in fact we get what we want. So here's my natural log, it's gonna read this to me. So now I'm gonna put this in a log pro. Okay, so let's grab this. Alright. Logger Pro again. Okay, so pay attention. Help me out. Help me out, please. My X is my time period. What was my seconds for the first uh, for the first run, first experiment? Twenty-nine seconds. My Y. Excuse me, guys. My Y is the natural log. What's that value? Ne a negative what? Three point. Okay. Second experiment was how many seconds? Thirty-six. What was the? Um, okay. Third. It was. Forty-five. 
45 seconds. Negative point, negative four point what? Okay, next one was 59 seconds. Negative four six one, good. Last one was 82. 81. And negative four point seven seconds. Or I think that's nine. Nine? Nine. Come on, Kate. Sorry. Okay. So let's change this to like negative three and let's do our like negative uh, 3.5 just changing the axes and you can see party people do a regression line all right you can see <laughs> that despite my measurements and despite our uh, measurement devices in terms of clicking and our, our stop and starts, uh, we get a pretty linear line. And we get a negative what? We get a negative slope. Okay, and this proves that the iodate ion with respect to the rest of the reaction is first order because when you get a negative slope using the limit of your concentrations, you get this linear line. Now, the slope is negative 0.0202. What does that represent? Yeah, the rate law constant. We, can, we found the rate law constant. So the negative 0.0202 that this is telling me through the regression line, this is my R. So this is how we actually can find. Now, could we do this another way? Could I do two experiments and do the math to figure out? The, sure we could. We could compare uh, the time to one to the concentration to the one, and we can solve it. And this time change is the same as this changes, and you'd see it's a first order. But another way to graph it. So this is the experimental graphing I talked about. If I did not, if it clearly this was going upward or downward, this would not be first order. So a pretty cool demo that we did last year. We we basically APified it by showing how this all works, hopefully. I don't know who we are, me and my, uh, my uh, um, posse. yeah, posse. <laughs> Okay.